everybody. My name is Debbie Karaman. I am a burn prevention educator at both the Grossman Burn Center and the Children's Burn Foundation. The Grossman Burn Center is a burn treatment center in West Hills Hospital in West Hills, California. And the Children's Burn Foundation is a nonprofit foundation located in Sherman Oaks. We cover the cost and ancillary services uh, for bringing children in from all over the world and providing them with burn care when they've had serious burns. Our prog program today is brought to you by both entities because uh, the highest risk groups for burn injury are small children and after that, seniors. And often the risks to seniors are very closely related to the risks to small children. So as we go through our program today, for those of you who have small children living in the home, think about what different things you can do to help prevent burns to yourself, but also to those small children. We'll talk about common burns in the kitchen, common burns in the bathroom, and then we'll finish up talking about first aid. I hope you enjoy the program. The most common burns that happen to seniors in the kitchen happen from fire, they happen from scald, which is a hot liquid burn. They happen from hot solid objects like a hot pan or burner. We call that a contact burn. And a burn can happen if you fall when you're carrying something hot or if you fall into something hot. When you're cooking, we always recommend wearing short sleeves, close fitting clothes. You can use an apron to tie your clothes in if need be. Make sure you use pot holders anytime you're in doubt. And for those of you with long hair, make sure to tie your hair back. At the stove top, keep all flammables at least three feet from the stove, and that would incur include papers, curtains, other fabrics that can catch on fire easily. We always recommend keeping uh, cooking on the rear burner. Even though you have to reach, the rear burner is much safer because it's much more difficult to knock a pan over. And even if your pan does spill, the contents stay on the stove top. They don't fall over the front of the stove. If you do need to use the front burners, Turn your pan handles in towards the center of the stove. Don't let them hang over the floor because it's much easier to knock them down. On your kitchen countertops, make sure you don't have a lot of clutter so you can easily see what's going on. Follow directions to all appliances that get hot like a slow cooker or a coffee maker or toaster oven. Keep your appliances and their cords at the back of the countertop at all times. People tend to pull their appliances forward when they're using them. Now that becomes it more of a hazard because it's much more um, easy to knock that appliance off. And we don't recommend using extension cords for hot appliances simply because the longer the cord, the more possibility there is for snagging it and pulling the uh, um, uh, uh, device off the countertop. When you're cooking at the stovetop, we always recommend not cooking while you're drowsy, not cooking, um, let's say, in the oven or having something simmering on the stove when you're sleeping. We always recommend staying in the, cook to in the kitchen while cooking on the stovetop. We recommend staying in the home while you're baking or roasting. If a pan fire starts, uh, people have all kinds of ideas about what they should put on the fire. The only thing we recommend is what you see in the picture, and that is smothering the fire from the side, not from the top, with a matching pan lid. We don't recommend using water because water can cause grease to spray. If the fire is a grease fire, that gre hot grease hitting your skin can end up causing some serious burns. If an oven fire happens, keep the oven door closed, turn off the oven, and wait the fire will extinguish itself within a certain amount of time. When you're cooking in the microwave, we always recommend keeping your microwave on the kitchen counter and using proper cookware for a microwave oven. Let your food cool in the microwave for about a minute or so before you open the oven. Make sure you use your pot holders again and mix your food carefully before serving. Also, if you're heating hot liquid, don't overfill the container. Leave at least one inch of space between the top of your container and the top of your hot liquid to prevent spills as you pull it out of the microwave. Falls can happen uh, and be quite disastrous if you happen to have something hot in your hands or if you fall into something hot. So in the kitchen, make sure you, when possible, have a non-slip floor service and also use non-slip mats in your food prefer preparation areas, for example, in front of the sink or in front of the stove, if you use mats at all. Don't walk around in your socks in the kitchen because socks, socks are much more slippery than your shoes. If something spills on the floor 
stop what you're doing and wipe up the spill right away because if you forget about it, it becomes a fall hazard later. And lastly, when you're planning to carry something hot across the kitchen, before you make that trip, check your floor path, make sure you don't have any obstacles on the floor such as pets, children, toys, shoes, etc. Let's talk now about uh, scald burns, which are burns from hot liquid. They can also happen in the bathroom. We've talked about them in the kitchen, but what, uh, they can also happen in the bath when you're getting ready for a bath or a shower. We always encourage everyone to set their hot water heater temperature for no more than 120 degrees, or if your hot water heater dial has words instead of numbers, you can set it to the warm setting or perhaps anti-scald setting. Generally, a comfortable bathing temperature for seniors whose, whose skin is starting to thin is between 100 and 101 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very similar to the temperature that we recommend for small children. If you cannot control the temperature of the water in your water heater, you can purchase a scald protection shower head, which will automatically shut your water temperature off if it gets hotter than 120 degrees. It doesn't prevent all burns, but it does a good job of preventing very serious catastrophic burns that happen in less than one second with very, very, very hot water. We always recommend uh, using your grab bars, purchasing a shower chair, which you see in the upper right corner. If you have a bathtub that you have to step over to get into the shower. Uh, with the shower chair, you can just sit down on it and slide across. Always use non-slip mats if you use mats at all in the bathtub. And also keep your phone with you while you're bathing. You can put a rubber band with a string tied to it around your cell phone set the phone down and allow the string to run onto the shower floor so that if you do fall and you're down on the floor, you can pick up the string and pull your cell phone to you. While you're sleeping, we recommend highly against using electric blankets. If you use a heating pad, only use the heating pad for 15 20 to 20 minutes at a time. If you need to, use a time it to limit exposure, but many of the more recent heating pads have a timer on them. Also, it's very important not to place any body weight on your electric heating pad. The heating pad is meant to sit on top of your body, not underneath it. And you can also purchase non-electric alternatives like a microwavable heat pack if you need a heat to a certain part of your body. If a burn happens, for burn, uh, burn first aid, we, we always recommend removing the hot object from your body, uh, from, from where, wherever the, whatever part of the body got burned, and then running cold tap water on the burn for anywhere from five to 20 minutes. The purpose of using cold water is to allow that coolness to penetrate through the burn, to slowly draw off the heat from the body and keep the heat from penetrating more deeply and actually making the burn worse. We don't recommend ice because ice is very cold. It can actually cause a burn, which we call frostbite. Ice can constrict blood vessels around the burn and actually uh, delay the healing process. It can just in general cause more trauma to the burn. We don't recommend butter or any other products containing grease because those clog the skin pores and make it much more difficult for the skin to cool down. We don't recommend animal products like egg whites or mayonnaise because while unlikely, they can cause infection. We don't recommend remedies that, generally remedies that were passed down in your family like toothpaste, mustard, onion slices, tomato slices, don't really have enough coolness to actually make a difference to the temperature of your burn. So they're not really going to uh, help it cool down any faster. If you get blisters from a burn, that means you have a second degree burn, we don't recommend opening the blisters. Rather, apply antibiotic cream uh, to the broken skin. In, but otherwise you don't need to, need to use an antibiotic. Once you put cold water on a burn for a long period of time, if you'd like, you can put aloe vera gel on the burn. We also recommend making an assessment after running cold water on the burn about whether you believe you need to call 911 or go in for treatment. Thank you very much for attending our program today, and I hope all of you can find at least one or two changes to make in your home to help make you more burn safe. Thank you. It's that time of year again, pumpkin season. While pumpkin is harvested and enjoyed during the fall, 
canned pumpkin is available year-round, making it in a convenient and affordable pantry staple. It can be used in both sweet and savory dishes, and it's highly nutritious. It's packed with vitamin A, which is important for eye health, and full of heart-healthy fiber. Today, I'm gonna to show you three of my favorite recipes using canned pumpkin. The first recipe is pumpkin pie oatmeal. I'm starting with a bowl of warm oatmeal that I already cooked using half a cup of oats with one cup of milk. To that, I'm adding a fourth of a cup of canned pumpkin and giving it a nice mix until the ingredients are well combined. I'm topping the oatmeal with several pecans, a drizzle of maple syrup, and a pinch of cinnamon. The next recipe is pumpkin soup. I'm starting by heating one tablespoon of oil in a medium sized pot. To that, I'm adding one chopped onion, a half a cup of chopped celery, and two minced garlic cloves, along with some salt and pepper. We're gonna let this cook for about five to seven minutes until the onions are translucent. I'm now adding one 15 ounce can of pumpkin and a mixture of spices that include three fourths of a teaspoon of cinnamon, a half a teaspoon of ginger, and a half a teaspoon of nutmeg, along with two and a half cups of reduced sodium chicken broth. I'm now giving this a nice mix. Next, we are going to place a lid on the pan and let it simmer for 15 minutes. Once that is done, we are going to add a fourth of a cup of milk, and this is going to make the soup nice and creamy. The soup can be served just like this, or for a smooth consistency, it can be pureed in a blender. The last recipe is pumpkin peanut butter dip. In a bowl, I'm adding half a cup of canned pumpkin, half a cup of peanut butter, two to three tablespoons of honey, and a fourth of a teaspoon of cinnamon, but you can also use pumpkin spice. The last step here is to give everything a nice mix and to chill for at least 20 minutes. If you're looking for new ways to use canned pumpkin, give one of these recipes a try.